41 years and is known as America's Healthy Heart Doc. He has expertise in both interventional, he's the man that went in with a Volvo of your femoral artery and to put things in there. Okay, one arm. One arm. One leg. If you get something, we know what to do with the and preventative ther therapies emphasizing lifestyle changes. He owns Green Space Cafe and another one that just opened up. He practices heart disease reversal at the Consent for Cardiac Longevity. Dr. Joel Kahn. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. How many people were at my interrupted talk yesterday? Thank you very much. Yeah, I realized I was going to give a brief little introduction about my own career, briefly. It's not that amazing, but uh, I didn't do it, and today's topic is relevant to everybody in the room, but it's particularly poignant because what happened yesterday, heart disease, it's not just a discussion, it's a real deal. Uh, we don't usually face it too commonly in our own lives, but as a community, as a society, we do, and you know, the fact that somebody had a cardiac arrest yesterday is poignant. I was talking to a woman on the boat yesterday whose family uh, history is very concerning, and then uh, another woman, I'm from Detroit, was just in tears telling me that her 56-year-old brother two weeks ago dropped dead without any warning of a heart attack. Uh, and probably if we took a poll, how many of you in your own family have, uh, you know, whether it's somebody just dealing with heart disease or has had a tragedy, it's the real deal, and I do not think the medical system is doing a very good job of, of protecting us through their channels of communication and such. So I uh, grew up in Detroit, attended the University of Michigan uh, School of Medicine, go blue, and uh, went down to Dallas, Texas, yeehaw, learned how to be a cardiologist at that great institution, moved to Kansas City, Missouri, learned how to put a balloon in the stent and any artery in the body with one of the world's leading pioneers, Dr. Jeff Hartzer. And way back 1990, I came back to Michigan and had practiced very aggressive cardiology, uh, cath labs, stents, balloons, heart attacks, all the time, had tremendous uh, you know, experience, success, fun, really. It's a fun thing to do when somebody's in trouble and 20 minutes later, your, your super duper balloon has got them back in good shape. Uh, but through all that, as Dr. Blyway said, I had preceded all that by having adopted at age 18 a plant diet. I don't say plant-based anymore because it leaves too much wiggle room. A plant diet, all I eat are plants. Um, my wife had uh, joined me in that journey 41 years ago because we were together back then and are too still. And uh, it became the platform to uh, teach this throughout Detroit and more and more through books and other media all over the place. Um, and finally, about six, seven years ago, I found a program, actually University of South, South Florida in Tampa, that offered integrative cardiology. Integrative cardiology doesn't necessarily mean vegan. It's that word we hear sometimes, root cause. You know, why do people develop heart disease? Why did you develop heart disease? Is it diet? Is it sleep? Is it toxins? Is it allergies? Is it uh, genetics? Is it environment? And so some of what I'm going to talk about isn't just eat more radicchio. I love radicchio, and I love sprouts, but for a disease this pervasive, it may take a little bit more. So I think my next slide is just a celebration. Let's see. Yay! So how many people love Rich Roll? Love Rich Roll, love Rich Roll. So I'm the, this is, this is yesterday on the web. I'm the Rich Roll interviewee this week. It's the third time I've done that. Uh, very honored to do that. More produce and less loneliness keep the heart doctor away. And some other things I'm going to talk about. If you don't know who Rich Roll is, he should be on the cruise ship. He is a 51-year-old hunky, hunky guy who uh, at age 40 found plant diets and ultra fitness. Wrote an amazing book called Finding Ultra if you want an amazing book to read. And it's coming out with a second edition very soon. He's working on it. Um, has probably the most popular plant podcast. Uh, nobody can compete with the evil Joe Rogan. I mean, I know who that is, but this is more popular. But this is a widely read, and this is a good discussion uh, of nutrition. Uh, we, Dr. Uh, Rich Roll's podcast go on for two hours, three hours, so we talked for more than two hours. That's 
the biggest challenge is finding time to listen to his podcast. Okay, at 1600 is the most famous physician in England that Dr. Thomas Sydenham, who was called the English Hippocrates, wrote a textbook that was used in Europe for 200 years, had the vision to say that we don't all age the same way. We can have, you know, there's famous studies, twin studies, and maybe one twin smoked and one twin did, didn't, and the difference in just their facial appearance, very different rates of aging, even in genetically identical twins, environment matters. But he had this vision to say that you are as old as your arteries. If you could tell your arterial age, two words that very rarely are said in medical clinics, cardiology clinics, but if you knew your age, if you're 50 years old and your driver's license and your arteries could be measured and are more like a 40-year-old, you're in good shape for all the bad things in life, uh, including not just heart attack and stroke, but there's data that if your arteries are young, it reflects because our bodies aren't just arteries that a cardiologist sees and lungs that a lung doctor sees and kidneys that a kidney doctor sees. They're, this all works together. If your arteries are youthful, you probably have a much lower chance of dementia, cancer, COPD of the lungs and such. Interesting data. On the other hand, if you're 50 years old and your driver's license and your arteries can be measured in our 72 or 73, number one, you're going to be really bummed because I tell people that every day in my uh, clinic in Detroit. And two, we got to get out all measures to work on it because uh, it's a serious matter. You are true. This is the most accurate vision. I had a quote yesterday I shared with you. Paul Dudley White, a heart attack after age 80 is an act of God, a heart attack before age 80 is a failure of the medical system. That's also very powerful and true. But So we're going to talk about how you learn how old your arteries are. I don't care if you're vegan. You still need to know. Because you probably haven't been planning diet for 41 years. You might. Um, and still, you might have a genetic disorder that overcomes your exceptionally wonderful diet. Um, you know, and I'm pretty well invested in this. I've eaten this way for four decades. I own two restaurants, and I call it my 401k cafe. I mean, I've put some serious dollars into feeding the public the best food they can find in the Midwest in terms of both health and appearance. But I'm not going to give that up to just go to the restaurant business because this message is very important. So I wish this were true. If coronary artery disease was attacking your face rather than your heart, you'd do something about it. If it was coronary acne, we'd go get checked. But it's a silent process. Coronary artery disease is the fancy name for clogged arteries, blocked arteries, aged arteries, CAD. And it's just the truth that this is a heart disease to detect, a heart disease to consider, a heart disease to follow. So we just often don't do it, but we should. Uh, and we need to make it as obvious as a rash or a cut or a scrape. So real disease, real people, I won't go through all these, but the upper right side, that smiling, nice white-haired guy is James Cantalupo. He held the very powerful job of being CEO of McDonald's worldwide and about 10 years ago in a hotel room prepping to speak um, to his uh, franchisees. He's developed chest tightness, dropped to the floor and died. Uh, he actually was a good guy. He's the one that brought in salads and fruit cups into McDonald's. I mean, it's not like an evil man. <laughs> Don't have too much good to say about McDonald's, although apparently their veggie burger that they've introduced, and it is vegan, is selling like crazy in Europe. So we might see that come soon, but don't rush to eat it. One of my, one of my friends is the gentleman on the left. He was one of the most famous car designers in Detroit, Emory Molnar, did yoga, vegetarian. Not the same as plant diet, completely um, thin, and uh, went out for a bike ride four years ago in L.A. on vacation with his two young kids and never came back. Cardiac arrest, autopsy, 95% blocked artery. This is real stuff. Um, Oscar Munoz was, uh, is CEO of United Airlines, and six weeks after taking that job in 2015, had a massive heart attack. He was 54, 55 years old. I mean, you got to imagine this guy had good medical care. I mean, he's running one of the largest companies in America. And six weeks after starting his job, I mean, of course, there probably was stress. He's almost dead. By some grace of God, he did have a heart transplant a few months later. He's back to work. He's doing okay. But there's a problem if, you're that, uh, if you have that much access to great medical care. The last example, I should put a slide in, but just you can stick with me, is in November, 
Um, there's an annual meeting called the American Heart Association. Everybody knows American Heart Association, CPR training and such. Uh, American, Heart, American Heart Association symbol on Fruit Loops, which is the evil side of the American Heart Association. But um, they have an annual meeting with tens of thousands of cardiologists around the world discussing research and clinical care. And a 52-year-old cardiologist, John Warner, MD, from University of Texas, where I did my training, although I'm seven years older than him and I didn't know him back then, gives a big talk Sunday morning to the whole crowd, for reportedly 8,000 cardiologists, about the need to prevent heart disease. We're doing okay treating it, but we're not doing enough preventing it. And he announces, I've had no family members that are male ever live over 60 in my family, so this is really a passion to me. Monday morning, he has a cardiac arrest in his hotel room. And by the grace of God, his two young kids and his wife know CPR. And there were some doctors down the hall that grabbed the defibrillator. They shocked him a couple, three times. He, came, he was dead. He came back alive. And very fortunately, because of the quick response, his brain came back alive, rushed to a local California hospital to get a stent. But if you can be the president of the American Heart Association, he's, he's chairman of the Department of Cardiology at his major medical center, and he's actually chief of medicine. And I don't know if he knew he had plaque or not, um, but I doubt he's had all the testing that I will do for a school teacher in my clinic using their insurance uh, for the blood work and such. Uh, we got a lot of work to do. So, number one, I call this PDR, prevent, detect, and reverse. P is prevent. I won't go through all the data. I do have a book out there on the table called Debt Execs Don't Get Bonuses. It goes through this, and I'm rewriting it now, a second edition will be out there in the year. I'm re uh, but the data behind this, but you know, these are largely lifestyle related choices. They are in part environmental. Air pollution has become a very big factor in health uh, in terms of medical research. It probably always was a factor. Environmental toxins like plastic bottles, makes me worried right there. Uh, you know, even, even if you get a veggie grill roll in LA at one of the best kind of vegan fast food restaurants, the paper that the veggie rolls in leaches plastics into what you're eating. So fast food kills you about five different ways, one of which is actually the way it's served you in a plastic container and paper wrap. Even thermal receipts, you're at Starbucks, you got a black coffee or green tea, and they give you the receipt, and it immediately puts in your skin bisphenol A, BPA. So it's gotten to be, and I don't take receipts myself, I don't want them. I feel bad for the people who work there and touch them every day. And it sounds like I'm crazy, but the Endocrine Society and other medical societies, a report in one prestigious journal last week says this stuff is actually raising our blood pressure, making us infertile, changing our testosterone, changing our cholesterol levels. So it's a whole complex process. Food is the most important thing. And so when you eat plants, when you don't smother them or avoid all oils, uh, when you eat a variety and a rainbow, and when you take some supplements, uh, you are in the best quadrant, but it doesn't mean you're totally protected, sorry to tell you. So, drugs do sometimes do this. It's a funny little picture, isn't it? I was just chatting with a gentleman who had booked a consult with me on the boat and talking about the pros and cons of being on a cholesterol-lowering, statin, Lipitor kind of medicine for your whole life. Uh, most people would rather do things naturally, that's sometimes dangerous, uh, you know, some people with high blood pressure need medication and such, uh, not anti-all progress, but we know a lot of people have side effects. So, how quickly um, does a bad choice, oh honey, I just want that hoagie sandwich, give me a break, uh, you know, I, I'm doing so much better overall, let me have some fun once in a while. So this is a study from the University of Maryland, the cardiologist Robert Vogel, who was one of my professors, because he had been in Ann Arbor, who asked the question, we know that garbage food is bad for you long term, but is garbage food bad for your arteries like right away? Is it like a bomb going off? Is it toxic? So there's uh, two healthy volunteers showed up at the University of Maryland twice. Once they were fed a bowl of oatmeal, and as it says, they're low fat. They prepared it with water. Those are the blue dots. And once they came back and they fed them, McDonald's egg McMuffins. They just went down the street, grabbed the whole bag, brought them back, had them eat one. And what they're measuring was a whole apparatus on the arm, but it's how healthy your arteries are. Are your arteries acting youthful, flexible, and dilating? Are your arteries stiff and aged? And the bowl of oatmeal made with water did nothing to harm arteries, thank goodness. These were young people, their arteries were working fine at the beginning. But you can see what, for four hours, eating one 
high animal fat, high animal meat, high salt, high uh, chemical laden meal does to artery function. It drops and drops and drops and drops, drops for four hours. It actually takes till it's about lunchtime to come back to normal, and then people will go to KFC and get a bucket, and then they'll go to you know Carl's Jr. and get dinner. And there probably are people that are spending more than half of their day with circulating toxins, and that's what it is. This doesn't happen because your jaw is moving, it's happening because you digest and absorb some toxic materials, particularly in poor quality fast food <laughs> level of meats. Uh, but even if you're eating grass-fed, top-notch meat, there's gonna be chemicals in there that release inflammatory particles. So you know, be very, very careful uh, every meal um, about what goes in your body. Not in a neurotic way, we do want to enjoy, we do want to celebrate, but learn to celebrate with you know, healthier versions of majority of the time. Uh, there we go. So some of you have seen this, this is Dr. Michael Greger in the audience. But um, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. It was attributed to Hippocrates. Dr. Greger tells a story that he was discussing to medical students about a new drug called uh, Ilacorb, you've heard this, you know, that it can reduce blood pressure and prevent cancer and uh, make you think smarter and live longer and it actually just broccoli backwards. But it's true. <laughs> you know, it's, I, should, I actually should put it on the other side, but um, Ilacorb. But it's true that it's powerful and you've heard that all through this trip. So, P was for prevent. Is there a lifestyle that prevents heart attacks that's simple? We could go into a thousand permutations. Well, these are two studies involving 40,000 people in Europe, recent studies, that looked at the question, I didn't have any heart disease when you asked me how I ate and lived. And you you found me 20 years later and asked me if I've had a bypass, a stent, a heart attack, if I'm still alive, or died of heart disease. And these five or six, and I'll tell you the sixth one, uh, were found as the predictors of being free of heart attack. You've read it already, don't smoke, walk, you get Eat a lot of fruit and vegetables. This isn't vegan science, this is nutrition science. Eat a lot of fruit and vegetables. Sleep at night. That was a new one in the last 10 years. The people that sleep less than five hours a night or people that manage decent sleep for seven or eight hours have a very big difference in the risk in follow-up of suffering a heart attack. And consistently, uh, you know, there's confusing messages about the role of alcohol in health or disease. Consistently in heart-based studies, a little bit of booze. I got a little grief from Dr. Blyweitz for being an Italian wine snob two nights ago. Last night, not at all. Um, I don't care very good. Um, but consistently, a little bit of alcohol favors health. You can do it, thank you very much, with unsweetened grape juice. or studies thank you. And so most of the benefit of wine can also be enjoyed with unsweetened grape juice or eat grapes. This last week, I, I followed the, both the headlines and the science behind it pretty closely. Two studies came out about the role of alcohol in health. One was a study of people over age 90 looking at lifestyle factors that might predict why they had good health over age 90. And regular use of alcohol was the strongest predictor of being uh, sharp and fun over age 90. But the second study that came out was that excessive alcohol use is one of the strongest predictors of developing uh, dementia. So you've got to actually be a little careful with this stuff and not overdo it. And if you have issues with self-control, just don't, just omit the alcohol. What isn't on this list but should be was a thin waist. And we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk particularly in a talk tomorrow I have on reversing heart disease on uh, weight loss and fasting, an absolutely great topic you should come back and hear. But, a thin waist predicts freedom from heart attack. The specific numbers in these studies were keeping your waist less than 40 inches as a man, less than 35 inches as a woman. Not exactly in an outrageous you know, goal. You don't have to, in these studies, have a 30 inch waist. Um, I had a 30 inch waist at birth, I think. But, you know, you got that. I mean, are you doing all those? In the American public, the one that we do the least is fruits and vegetables, five servings a day. It's about 3% of the American public, and only about 15% smoke. Half of Americans do exercise, sleep a little harder number, 100% drink too much, so you know, we got all that. So how bad are we at predicting? So number two is early detection. Whoever would have thought that Winston Churchill would make it to 91, or maybe Donald Trump will make it to 91. <laughs> I y'all love that idea. I may you know, just change the Constitution to be our president for the next 20 years. 
<laughs> the stock market is not such a bad thought. Um, but who would ever thought that Winston Churchill would make it to 91 with a body and a lifestyle and a stress level? But this famous runner, who, if you're old like me, you remember the book of running, a book with red cover and the legs in the 1970s that kind of started the whole marathon craze. And he died uh, suddenly while running at age 53 at autopsy. He had very severe heart blockage. He was famous for saying, I can outrun any diet. And he apparently ate very poorly. He may have had some genetic issues too. So if we're that bad, you know, and if the American Heart Association president doesn't know, and if um, the CEO of United Airlines how well do you know, or do I know, you know, what's going on? So we have to go beyond that. And we have to know where on this spectrum, from an artery at the top that just is a pipe doing its job with what's called a healthy endothelium or healthy lining like wallpaper, or where are we on this spectrum onto what at the bottom is called complicated lesions, that after a big heavy meal, after an argument with a spouse, after shoveling cold snow, after vigorous sex, with a inappropriate partner, because uh, actually, se I should talk about that right now. Sex with a partner of stability, you know, a wife, a husband, or a consistent significant other, has data for it for reducing heart attack risk that's insanely powerful. There's a little town in Wales called Tarfordley, and they have had good follow-up, like Framingham, Massachusetts, for years and years and years. And the magic number in Tarfordley is guys that engage in sex and complete the act. You have to complete the act. It's kind of a funny little question to ask these little old men in Wales. I know you would say you're with your wife, but I want to know about the very last moment you make it there. Uh, eight, a hundred times a year, drop the risk of heart attacks by 50% compared to, it's eight a month. So just put it on your app. Put it on an app eight times a month. Honey, 50%, that's more than aspirin. Uh, I say ass, not aspirin. <laughs> but if you, if you really want to take this topic, which is totally inappropriate, but it is science, to one more level, there is a very powerful study on John Hopkins that men that engage in sex 21 times a month have half the risk of prostate cancer. So that's really a load to consider there. So. Tomorrow's morning, yoga and tai chi have been canceled. <laughs> Come into the dining room with your thumb. <laughs> All right, complicated reasons. I don't know where I got that. Whoops. So how good is routine blood work? And you can pick a thousand studies as just one. My doc said my cholesterol is pretty average, but I said my blood work looked pretty good. I'm pretty confident I'm not going to be Dr. Warner from American Heart. And you can see blood work is critically important. Actually, good blood work is critically important. But a lot of people that end up being hospitalized with coronary artery disease. Uh, clogged artery problems have an LDL cholesterol in a relatively normal range. They're picking here 135 and less, but even, you know, here are people with LDLs of 50, 60, 70. Because cholesterol never was the only thing that caused heart disease. It does cause heart disease. When I was a fellow, cardiology fellow in Dallas, Texas, it was the center of cholesterol research in the world. They just won a Nobel Prize in medicine. And they would get these patients referred from all over the world. I took care of a little girl named Stormy Jones, whose cholesterol was 1,100. She's 11 years old, cholesterol was 1,100. She doesn't smoke, she's not doing anything else wrong, and she had bypass surgery in her day. She wanted to have a liver transplant and then died about age 14. Cholesterol matters a lot, but it never was the only factor. There's other things in the blood, your blood sugar, your blood pressure, uh, genetic factors, something I talk about a lot, lipoprotein A. Um, but, you know, getting that lab result from your doctor is, or your nurse or your PA or just sending off and doing it on your own, which you can do now, is not enough. Um, and the reason it's not enough uh, is, one, it's a blood test, but two, even stress tests. You've heard about executive physicals doing a stress test. So there's four arteries up there. A pretty clean one on the right, but a little plaque is the yellow butter-looking stuff. A little bit more advanced and the little white things are supposed to be calcium, something you find in bone but should never find in arteries, but always is deposited in damaged parts of the body. And then a little more uh, narrowing in calcium and a lot more narrowing in calcium. So early, moderate, advanced, and late. Of course, you'd like to be right here in one that's normal. You know, modest obstruction, will you have any tightness in your chest? Will it feel bad to shovel snow or make love or 
uh, eat a big meal and go out a walk right after. No, 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 no. Not until it's very, very advanced. Our body in general can adapt to so much stuff. Our heart muscles specifically can get by pretty darn well with narrowed arteries and give absolutely no clue. So just asking if you feel good is not enough. Stress tests similarly is not enough because stress tests will show changes, whether it's just walk the treadmill, whether it's walk the treadmill with what's called an echo test, stress echo, whether it's walk the treadmill and they inject you with radioactivity called the stress nuclear, which I've ordered on about 100,000 patients in my career, I've read that many, but I don't do it anymore because it's way too much radiation to give a human. Anyways, that will only be reliably abnormal when you got very advanced disease. Well, where do we ever wait and say, I'll just take care of your breast cancer when it's very advanced, I'll take care of your colon cancer when it's very advanced. It's all about detecting it early, and these not only is a executive physical stress test not actually supported by science, it's not very effective. It couldn't even be harmful. Your blood work's good, Mr. Jones. Your stress test was good, Mrs. Smith. You're doing fine, and you're full of 50% blockages, and you have a big meal of fettuccine Alfredo like uh, Gandolfini, James Gandolfini from The Sopranos five, six years ago, and you drop over dead after a big fatty animal-based meal. That does really happen. So there is this um, test called a cardiac CT. If Winston Churchill had one, I don't know what it would have shown, but Jim Fix would have told him a year and five years before he died, you're in trouble, buddy. And it would have done the same for John Warner, cardiologist. It would have done the same for my friend, Henry Molnar, car designer. Um, at least to give them a heads up. That if you're not feeling well, get it checked, don't ignore it, and maybe find out in detail um, what you can do to actually try and identify and even reverse uh, heart artery in general and calcified heart artery specifically. So this is a very scary picture from a vitamin company in Fort Lauderdale called Life Extension, but it points out, and it's hard to read, I'll read you a few of them, that a cholesterol measurement is by far not the only thing that clogs up arteries. Over here it says hypertension, high blood pressure. There's one you may not know about it called homocysteine. Uh, a low HDL level, uh, too much insulin in your blood, too low of a vitamin D level. There's a dagger that should be here called something called lipoprotein A. Anybody know who Bob Harper is from The Biggest Loser Show? Part-time vegan, sometimes vegan. Um, we, all, we want all these people to be vegans and we're getting more and more of them, of course. So Bob Harper was uh, on a treadmill at age 51 February of last year and dropped out of a cardiac arrest. He was a smart man because he keeps a cardiologist on the treadmill next to him just by coincidence. And right in front of the treadmill was a defibrillator and the cardiologist grabbed him and shocked him back to life within seconds. But he got rushed to a hospital, emergency stent, was on a uh, ventilator in the ICU for a few days. But he's recovered completely and he seems he posts on Instagram like no other. Um, a nearly planned diet, I think he's got the message buttered his coffee, which he was doing and promoting before the heart attack was not such a good idea in retrospect. But he announced on the Dr. Oz show that he had a dagger. I mean, this guy's 51, he's fit. He was eating a lot of plants with some other less than ideal things. That he had a genetic uh, abnormality called lipoprotein A. It's a kind of cholesterol, it costs you 30 bucks to know your blood level. L-I-P-O, lipoprotein A. And you might have a sky high level and never been told it in your life. Uh, the doc says I had bypass, but nobody knows why I'm a freak, so I can do what I want. No, you probably got a high level protein A, and you probably need to find somebody who knows what they're doing in terms of considering uh, whether you leave it alone or treat it or what. Um, and that's just one. So you, you can't get routine stuff for a disease this uh, tricky, for a disease this common. And there are things you can do. This is an example of advanced blood work, CAT scanner, and that's an ultrasound machine, and I'll just point out to you, because this is a hard test to find, but a very wonderful test. It's called a C-I-M-T, C for carotid, and just remember the T is for thickness. But before your arteries actually get narrowed, they get thicker. They get thicker from cholesterol, they get thicker from white blood cells, they get thicker uh, from calcium. And if you uh, have a, a facility, might be a university in your town, might be a vascular surgeon, might be a cardiologist. You probably don't have one in your town, though that's a problem. That test takes about 15, 20 minutes, no radiation. And it can give you that arterial age. So when I'm talking to a patient 
and say, you know, you were concerned and sure enough, you're 20 years older inside, you're more like a 70 year old man than a 50 year old man or vice versa for one or whatever. Um, it's often based on that ultrasound technique and because it's ultrasound, you can repeat it with no radiation risk. Uh, and it's available if you're from Los Angeles, you can get one at Cedars. Um, the whole Florida area is really hard to find a place to get one. I do them in my office. It was a, a special thing to do. But the one that's widely available is CT scanning. Every city you live in around the world has a hospital of medium or large size that can do a CAT scan that takes about 10 seconds. No needle, no injection, no iodine, no pain, no claustrophobia. These are not the MRI scanner that you feel like you're suffocating. And in those 10 seconds, you get a picture of your heart that has been called the heart's mammogram. You know, we don't uh, put a stethoscope on the breast and say it doesn't sound like any cancer that's good enough. We do a picture of the breast, whether we do it by thermography, do it by mammography, do it by MRI. And we don't, you know, we don't ask you how much broccoli you ate and tell you don't need a colonoscopy. You're supposed to get screened and be checked and look all the way up that pipe, make sure there's no funny growths. But we don't do that for the heart. And we know that stress tests aren't good enough and not approved and all those other factors. This is the number one killer of men and women in America. So that big yellow arrow is looking at a hunk of bone where there should be nothing but a soft, a youthful, fleshy artery. And that hunk of bone is calcium in the widow maker, the left anterior descending artery. It took about 10 seconds. This was a thousand dollar test in most cities 10 years ago. In some cities, in South Bend, Indiana, it's $45. My city is $75. Just talked to a gentleman in Seattle, $100. You know, you might not get reimbursement. In, in the state of Texas, every citizen's entitled to get this as a covered benefit at age uh, 50. So all citizens of Texas. There's a movie, if you ever have a free moment on Netflix, called The Widowmaker. It says, why does Texas offer this as a covered benefit to every citizen? It's a fascinating documentary. After you've watched Forks Overnight, What the Health and Game Changers, <laughs> Watch um, with your uh, your oil-free popcorn, organic, non-GMO. Uh, but of course, you have to have turmeric on your popcorn right now, so fingers get on yellow. It's a whole process. My wife is addicted to turmeric popcorn. Oh my God, it's very good uh, with black pepper, so you really absorb it. So I just want to point out. I mean, this isn't just the odd cardiologist. Well, let me go back. There is a society that was formed in 2005 by frustrated cardiologists. How come we aren't focusing on this problem? It's called SHADE. Uh, you don't have to write it down. Society of Heart Attack Prevention and Eradication. And a lot of this stuff comes from them. But at the top, they talk about how you can use that carotid thickness ultrasound. Then they talk about MRI. That doesn't help much. But the CT they talk about and how you can you know, how difficult it is to know just from lab work, but you gotta do, these are very fancy labs listed there that almost everybody can have done through their insurance plan, at least some of them, to know the score. I'm gonna talk about all that, so there's a CT fancy slide. Hello. Let me see, there we go. Sorry, I apologize, apologize. The best test for the prediction of the risk of atherosclerosis is demonstrating atherosclerosis which is why colonoscopy and mammography, why a dentist looks in your mouth, not your ear, because you need to look at the organ. So Dr. Schaefer, uh, a very prominent uh, vascular specialist, said, this is what we should be doing. Uh, uh, what did I would say? Sorry, this is a trigger happy. Aha, this is, when I, one of the reasons I'm a cardiologist is I had a little murmur as a kid and had to go for checkups and had a heart cath and everything's fine. But that's my uh, cardiologist holding a cigarette while he's examining me. So the fact that we don't do these heart CT scans doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do because things move and change very, very slowly in the medical world. Okay, there we go. Um, and this calcification of arteries, which again, you see a little there, that white stuff, that's a really blown up um, uh, x-ray of the heart, uh, is the earliest available way um, to identify this problem. Uh, this is an example of those carotid thickness ultrasounds because you might have trouble finding it otherwise. It's a person that on the, that's the right carotid artery going through the neck up towards the brain. It says less than 20% narrowed. The left carotid less than 20% narrowed. It tells you in millimeters how big a hunk of uh, butter before it became vegan 
there is in that artery. And this is the neat thing. So this is a 56-year-old, I'm not sure if it's a man, oh, man. But by the measurement of how thick his artery is, which is that red dot, he's 60 years old inside. Um, he, 50th person, but that's not that bad, actually. I mean, that's not a dramatic one, because there's got to be a little wiggle room. But with this kind of detail, you know, you see the word arterial age, you can really give people real advice. Hey, this is working for you. It says right here, your arteries should be about 0 0.6 millimeters thick. He had a measurement over there of 0 0.75. It is reversible, it can come down, but it really has expanded ability to be precise. So when you're on a health club, when you're on a cruise ship, when you're you know, doing athletic activities, do most people know where they stand? And unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work out well, like Bob Harper. So this is done at six seconds, 10 seconds, uh, very low radiation exposure, and my God, look at that CAT scan, just arteries chock full of heart bone. Um, it isn't just heart arteries, that's again, the arrow's pointing at the widow maker, but that little hunk of white, that's the aorta, and you will sometimes, I, I'm like a sleuth in the office, a chest x-ray, a simple chest x-ray for a cough, might say blood vessels look calcified. They won't, you can't see the heart arteries, but you can see the aorta. You might have had a CT scan for a gallbladder problem, and the report says somewhere that the aorta is calcified. Or you might have had a chest CT for a lung problem, and the radiologist reads it as calcified, or even worse, they're calcified and the radiologist doesn't read it. But, you know, your doctor doesn't tell you that the report actually identified heart disease. I can't tell you how many dozens of people I said, well, it's not a question if you have heart disease. Let me show you the report. Let me show you the images on that chest CT you had because you needed follow-up because you coughed up some blood or whatever other reason. So you need to be hyper-vigilant about these studies that are being done. And very often if it's done, then you don't need that dedicated CAT scan. Uh, you need somebody just to look at it. So there are actually, and not to confuse, there are two kinds. CAT scans of the heart are a new thing, new if you believe 20 years is new. Because when CAT scans came out, the heart always moves. And most people, your brain is not going like this. Your heart's going like this. So we could get good brain studies. But with the heart moving, we couldn't get good studies until about 20 years ago because of technology and imaging speed. And now we have actually two kinds. We have the one called CAC coronary artery calcium, this $7,500 10 second test, like the picture in the upper left there with calcium in the widow maker. But you can also now do one called a coronary CT angiogram. It requires an IV, it requires injecting dye, you get hot flush for about 10 seconds. It doesn't take any longer than the other one, it takes less than a minute. It does cost a little bit longer, often around $1,000, but usually covered by insurance because there's a special reason you're doing it. You flunked a stress test, you've had some chest discomfort, uh, you've had bypass surgery, and you want to know how your bypasses look. So you can see on this one, you actually see arteries, not just the calcium, but you get you know, a complete view of arteries around the heart all the way down. Then a complete revolution, and the number of stress tests being done are much less. In my hospital in Detroit, 15 years ago, if you came in with some funny chest pain, You'd, be, you'd get an EKG, you'd get blood work, you'd be kept overnight, you'd have a stress test in the morning, and $45,000 later, you'd go home and say everything looked good. Now, within an hour, you're getting that, and if it's completely normal and your blood work's normal for maybe $2,500 and you've been in the hospital three hours, you're going home without any questions. So that's just one example where technology can you know, be of use because of the precision, because of the availability. These are not exotic. These are every city, Memphis, Dallas, Spokane, you know, Portland, Maine, wherever, these are all available. Uh, the top one may require a prescription, in some states it doesn't, but the bottom one always requires a physician or such person order. It has been shown to predict risk, and uh, the amount of plaque you have in your arteries predicts your risk of heart attack, future need, of uh, things like stents and even your very survival. Uh, and some of this data needs to be updated. The biggest concern some people have appropriately is how much x-ray am I exposed to? I don't want to have CT scans. So at the top, the coronary CT angiogram, the one you inject dye, does take a little bit longer, just a few seconds. There's a measurement called an MSV, but between seven and 11. 
How many of you, you don't have to show hands, have had a nuclear stress test? Well, a nuclear stress test gives you know, a fraction of the precise information these CTs do, and it's two to three times as much radiation, which I'm not excited about it. A catheterization, the standard test I've done a zillion times, is about the same amount of radiation. But here's this little coronary calcium, this little $75 test. It's radiation. Don't have one if you don't need one, so we'll, let me talk about that. But it's very, very low dose radiation. It's like a mammogram in its dose, so it's not become a major hesitancy. And you don't do it over and over and over. Uh, sometimes you never need to repeat it again. You don't need this if you've had a bypass, because if this is answering the question, do you have silent heart disease, you already got a scar to show you. You don't need this if you've had stents in your heart, because you already know that you have the problem. You don't need this if you've had a previous cardiac catheterization or CT scan that showed you have some plaque. You already know you got a problem. It's about 50-50. About half of us have a score that's zero, and we really don't have any clue, any evidence as an adult of coronary artery calcification. But at least half of us have some, and 10% of us have a massive amount that's really quite concerning. So, uh, why screen people that say they feel fine? Because this is a disease of the last day of life may be silent, that um, you can use calculators on your phone or in the doctor's office that put in your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your age, and get some numbers, but they fail 25, 35% of people. And we uh, do know that there's therapy available to help. I mean, a lot of that is lifestyle, for sure. So that could be an argument, why do I need a CT scan? I eat perfect. Because again, you might, and eat perfect, don't stop eating perfect. But you might have uh, something genetic you don't know about. Uh, you still should get checked, in my opinion. And again, four. So the shape, you saw the name before, SHAP. What they recommend is if you feel fine between the age of 45 and 75, you should be screened. If you're a woman, maybe between 55 and 75, you should be screened by either the CAT scan or the carotid thickness ultrasound. If you're younger than 45 for a guy, younger than 55 for a woman, but you have obvious risks. You smoke, your father had a heart attack at age 38, your cholesterol is extraordinarily high, maybe you actually know you have a high lipoprotein A and such. If you're a diabetic, diabetics, 38-year-old diabetic guys and gals should get checked with something. Um, if you have absolutely nothing going on, you're 35 and you got a perfect lifestyle and you got no family history, I, I don't order these CT scans on 35-year-olds. But we do know that if you do the carotid, you'll find a lot of early plaques still at that age. So this is way too busy, but again, this is that shape. Apparently healthy people, 45, 55 men and women, extremely low risk is the green box. You just say, keep coming to green space, that's all you need. <laughs> But everybody else needs a test. And if it's normal, great. And if it's not normal, we can decide from there. We'll go through every step. How big a difference does this mean to a person? If you have a calcium score of zero, meaning no calcium was detected over five years, your risk of developing an emergency room visit, a heart attack, needing a stent, is very close to 0%. And you can see if your number is over 300, because there is a number, that's why it's called a score, and some people are over 500 and some people are over 1,000. But you got about five times the risk, and some studies show 20 times the risk. You can really uh, decide who needs wraparound love, advanced labs, more frequent visits, and who can uh, have a gentle celebration with a green smoothie. And uh, you know maybe come back in five to 10 years and do it again. I'm gonna skip some of that. This is another example. When your calcium score is over 300, versus a calcium score at zero, and this is over about eight years, your risk of, of being alive without heart events is dramatically better. And there's no other single test we can uh, show that has the same follow-up. This is from a study of almost 3,000 people, a very prestigious group of researchers. So it's not like there isn't data. So it asks that, begs that question. Uh, these are three different people that say, I'm fine, leave me alone, I can go to the gym, I feel great. Mr. or Mrs. A, and it really is fascinating. You can, these are heart arteries right there. That's the left main, the widowmaker, the circumflex. No calcium, zero score, wonderful. Same artery showing moderate calcification. And then these crazy examples of 
you know, heavy, heavy, heavy calcification of heart arteries. It is a disease. That person needs a stress test. Um, the others don't. That person, you know, rarely flunks a stress test despite symptoms and ends up having a bypass or a stent just because the stress test is so awful rotten. But they might want to choose to follow a Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Hornish program, um, depending on the circumstances and not move on to something as dramatic as that. If they're feeling good, rarely do you need bypass if you're feeling good. Um, Let's do that again. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, so we've talked about that you know there is a lifestyle to help you prevent heart disease and that's important. There's tests available to detect heart disease that's critically important. And then what if you have it and you're aware that there is data, probably the best data in the world in plant medicine is its impact on heart disease. I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail tomorrow because I have some other brand new data here. But uh, it's not just Dr. Ornish there in the middle, a book published in 1990 that became an instant bestseller, talking about stress management with yoga and meditation and Tai Chi, talking about walking every day, talking about um, socialization, having friends and support, like this trip here represents, and talking about a plant diet uh, to support healthy vessel recovery and showing what an impact that made on arteries, what an impact that made on trips to the emergency room, and really could have changed medicine dramatically. But I'm going to talk about that in much detail tomorrow's talk. Uh, because I also wear this integrative hat, I just want to tease you a little bit with some data. This is uh, an example of a 68-year-old man whose coronary artery calcium score was 1900. But the numbers are going down, and they're going down pretty quickly. And this comes from a study published in 2004 where in 100 patients, a treatment was given that actually was able to drop the calcium score as if we were reversing aging. And 58% of people within just four months, some of them reversed their calcium score all the way to zero. I'm going to tell you, I've never seen anybody reverse to zero. I do see people reverse. This was using a, or it, it is using, because it's available, an oral vitamin that has something in it. You may know the word chelation not here to give you a big pitch on chelation, but chelation is the idea that there are chemicals that can go in the body by IV, it used to be a suppository, now it's, a, it's a, a capsule, and they can actually grab on to the plaque and the calcium and actually take it out and remove it. And it was developed because of people getting acutely ill, exposed to lead and mercury in factories, and these people were at risk of dying, and this was a therapy developed to grab onto the lead, grab onto the mercury. Well, it seems to also grab on to arterial calcification. And it used to be considered fringe, maybe even a joke. When patients came to me seven years ago, I'd say that's just a waste of your money and time to go sit there with an IV in your arm for hours once a week. But in 2012, the University of Miami, the same medical center that's sponsoring the CME Talks here, uh, published a very large, high-quality study that showed that there actually is something to chelation in terms of effectiveness in heart patients. And there is right now ongoing a second part of that trial funded by our government with $40 million to uh, answer even more questions about it. So that's something out there about these numbers actually going down in time, very hopeful. There's a vitamin called vitamin K2. Vitamins should come from our food. About 100 years ago, vitamin K1 was identified, K was for coagulation in German, or blood clotting, and vitamin K1 is involved in blood clotting, and if anybody has heard of the drug or takes the drug warfarin or Coumadin, a blood thinner for blood clots and fibrillation and valves, you know, often they're advised not to eat too many leafy green vegetables, because leafy green vegetables are rich in vitamin K1, and they may actually fight the medicine you're taking to thin your blood. But and warfarin is used much less than it used to be. We can get vitamin K1 from leafy green vegetables. But there's a vitamin called vitamin K2 discovered about 40 years ago. A little harder to get in our diet. There's a kind of fermented soy called natto, which Japanese cultures love to eat as part of sushi and other uh, uh, diets. It's a funny smelling, funny tasting fermented soy. Most American Western palates don't like it a little bit like a dirty gym shoe or Limburger cheese. And there's not too many other rich sources of plant-based vitamin K2. So some people have brought up the question. So it's, it's believed that uh, one of the reasons the heart disease rates in Japan have traditionally been so low is 
they have a dietary source of vitamin K2. There's a little bit in butter, but I don't advise people start eating butter just to get vitamin K2 and hard cheeses. It is available as a vitamin you can take. Somebody like a Dr. Joel Furman that makes a multivitamin for uh, everybody, but particularly plant eaters, uh, puts vitamin K2 in his multivitamin. Most multivitamins do not. They might put vitamin K1. But this is some data from a very large study of 4,000 plus people in Rotterdam <coughs> that the higher your dietary intake of vitamin K2, the less calcified are your arteries. And the higher your dietary intake of vitamin K2, the less is your risk of having a death in follow-up. So that's not the gold standard we call a randomized study where half the people get the vitamin and half don't. I take vitamin K2 every day. I think it's a pretty benign thing. I don't know that for sure but I can't find any reports of any problems with it. Um, and if uh, somebody comes back with one of these CAT scans, abnormal, it's part of my standard protocol. There we go. Uh, okay, so slide out. I mentioned chelation. This is the study the University of Miami reported called TACT, TAC trial. And I just want to point out, because you don't need to know all the science, there's a green line that's low. That's how many events over five years did people in the trial have? And then there's a blue and purple line at the top that's higher. The blue and purple line were people that got placebo. They got placebo of the chelation, so they sat there for an hour getting a saltwater bag they thought might be the real McCoy. They also got placebo multivitamins. I know we hear a lot, multivitamins, yes, no, up, down. But they got placebo multivitamins. The green line, the one that had less events, got real intravenous medication and real multivitamins, and they had a big difference. This is what electrified the cardiology world in November 2012, prompted the government to ante up and do this again, just in diabetics, in a big study. So there are shreds of data where vitamins have value. It's, I think, rather rogue to say never, never, always expensive urine. All right, so yeah, are we going to eat butter? for our vitamin K2, I hope not. We've kind of lost our path as we talked about. Who knows who that is? Uh, I made that picture frame for him. He didn't appreciate the deal. <laughs> uh, you know, it's very confusing out there. I gotta remember where I'm going with these slides. He has a new book out, I'm curious to read it, called What Should We Eat? I'd much rather you read Juliana Hebert's new book or uh, Deanna Minnick's book uh, and such. Um, but it, he tells the story, and it's true, in 2014, Dr. Hyman and I were on a panel. He was sitting in the middle, I was on the right, and the Dr. Frank Lipman in New York was on the left. And um, we were discussing nutrition in general, and I proudly wore a shirt that said, vegan, and Dr. Lipman is insanely dedicated to the benefits of grass-fed beef and lamb. And Dr. Hyman shrugged his shoulder and said, vegan, paleo, I guess I'm vegan and kind of made up a word. So this new book is actually called The Vegan Diet. I would imagine, I got a little shout out in the intro, but I don't think I'm getting any royalties because he's gonna sell a lot. So uh, what are the factors from diet if it's not butter that we're eating? And I am not a fan of oil, but I also am a physician and a scientist and whatever. So this is a very famous study in 1999 where they went to Lyon, France, and they took men and women that had coronary heart disease and the traditional diet, of course, is going to be a lot of butter and a very saturated fat, uh, heavy diet. And they substituted for the butter in half the group a margarine uh, with canola oil. And some people go bananas when you mention canola oil, but you can buy organic canola oil. It's the highest oil in omega-3 fatty acids that's available. They followed these people up, and the results were stunning. They actually stopped the trial early. That substituting canola oil uh, for butter, very much like I showed in a slide uh, yesterday that the American Heart Association published uh, last year that confirmed uh, 18 years later, uh, if your habits were butter, lard, and ghee, and if you do nothing other than get over to vegetable oils, probably organic canola oil being the best of them for heart patients, you've done yourself a favor. There's no doubt the next step is better, because that was not studied in this group, what happens if you substitute as much or completely a no SOS salt oil sugar diet. But if you were going to transgress a bit, organic canola oil might not be bad. 
I, uh, I'm try, uh, trying to go back. Okay, I showed this yesterday, perhaps you weren't here. How important is it to try and reduce chicken, egg, cheese, animal-based saturated fats from the diet? And this is the results in the country of Finland that had the highest heart attack rate in the Western world in 1970 and instituted first a, a county-wide program, then a country-wide program, to eliminate as much as they could the saturated fat in chicken, egg, cheese consumption, substitute better foods, and they were able to drop all causes of death, heart deaths, coronary heart deaths, and heart attacks, cancers, by dramatic numbers. So if you're confused and you read a headline that says something favorable about butter, cheese, chicken, that vegans are all going into a nutritional toilet because we're missing so many critical nutrients. You just got to go back to some of this, you know, absolutely foundational data that is impressive. So there are a few other clues besides getting a CAT scan, besides having a carotid thickness study. You've heard before, I always want to repeat again, that a man starting to develop erectile dysfunction might be three, four years away from symptoms or actually having a heart attack because atherosclerosis or hardy arteries and uh, the other word endothelial dysfunction or the wallpaper or the artery malfunctioning may develop uh, in the bedroom before it develops on the treadmill at the health club or in an emergency room. So men with erectile dysfunction should get the CAT scan or get the carotid done, get all the blood work and seriously look at their lifestyle. I don't believe everybody that adopts a plant pure diet you know, gets that uh, response back fully, a lot of people do. Certain foods like beets, arugula, foods that support nitric oxide, watermelon, pomegranates are all uh, particularly important parts of the diet and have a lot of data. Um, threw this in because it's not just uh, bedroom uh, difficulties, but actually take good care of your teeth. Um, when you talk about root causes of disease, the standard question I ask every patient, how often do you go to the dentist, are your gums bleeding, do you have any known periodontal disease? The overall bulk of data in a publication a couple years ago from the American Heart Association was asymptomatic vascular disease, what we're talking about old arteries, have a relationship to gum disease. So whether you floss, whether you water pick, whether you see somebody that pokes and probes to see if you've got deep pockets and bleeding, it actually is a source of inflammation. It's a source of, um, ultimately, it appears to be heart disease. Uh, a study in the medical journals this week said, drinking red wine promotes better dental health, actually, um, that uh, you favor that. Another interesting little tidbit, and you may know this um, uh, from watching Dr. Greger videos, that if you still are using Listerine or Scope, Doc, I drink a big kale smoothie every morning, but you're telling me my blood pressure is not getting any better and my advanced blood work says I'm not making enough nitric oxide. If you're using antibacterial mouthwashes just because you're buying them, you know, there's occasionally the dentist needs to use them for periodontal gum disease. It can kill some good bacteria in your mouth, particularly in your tongue. And when you eat and chew leafy greens and kale and arugula and, and bok choy, you may not get the same boost in heart and artery health, the same lowering of blood pressure, the same relaxation of your arteries that you get if you stop using some of these bright blue you know, mouthwashes that have a, a lot of antibiotic, antibacterial components to them. Um, so it's interesting data. That was reported over the last few years. Actually, it was reported about four months ago that your risk of developing adult diabetes goes up if you're still using uh, strong antibacterial mouthwashes for no reason. You're far better to floss, you're far better to water pick, you're far better to get a automatic brush, you know, that goes on and on and on. And I have been late to the game in doing all that. I do it now. And to be rather descriptive, I use a Sonicare brush for three minutes all over the place. Then I water pick, and I can't believe how much kale is left. So. <laughs> I am, I'm amazed. It's like a game. How much can I get out? Um, so I'm fairly addicted to water picking because it, you know, it, it's, it's remarkable. And that is a source. Why does it matter? Well, one, you want to keep your teeth as long as you can for a variety of reasons. But two, if your gums get inflamed, this is very blood vessel rich vascular tissue, all bacterial, bacterial components, it gets in the body and it causes inflammation. 
And there are people that have a blood test called C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein tests of inflammation. We're going to talk about inflammation before I stop. Um, and they can't figure out why. Doc, I eat well, I'm thin, I sleep well, I don't have psoriasis. Psoriasis is a risk factor for heart disease, serious one, and diabetes. I don't have eczema, but why am I all inflamed? And uh, it turns out that they've got some, even their standard dentists may not have noticed. You sometimes need to do x-rays looking for hidden abscess, uh, and you can measure what kind of bacteria are in the mouth. But red wine, good. Listerine and scope, not so good. So inflammation. See, I'm doing running track, good. Inflammation, a word not known to most people. You know, you just say, darling, how you doing? Is your inflammation better today? It's just not part of our language. The middle part of the word is flame. Fire, heat, irritation. Um, it's a system we have in our body to protect us. Mosquito bites, liver, you know, scrape, white cells, swelling, blood flow. Three, four days later, where'd this liver go? Where'd the mosquito bite go? It brings the warriors in, the fighters, the soldiers, to fight off um, situations where our body's being attacked. But unfortunately, you can trigger inflammation that's going on every day, every day, every day, every day. And when you have things like what are called connective tissue diseases, autoimmune diseases, like lupus, like rheumatoid arthritis, that's inflammation gone crazy. Maybe triggered by diet, maybe triggered by viruses. But when you eat poorly, you also can incite with every meal. And I showed you the Egg McMuffin study way at the beginning. That's a wave of inflammation in the bloodstream that causes arteries to malfunction. So how important is it to get tested with blood tests particularly? And the names of the blood tests are up here. They're, these are rather fancy ones. The one anybody can get is HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. It's a blood test, costs you know, a few dollars. Every lab, every doctor could offer it. Right below it actually is a urine test that probably costs about $5. It's been around forever. It measures if little tiny bits of protein, albumin protein are showing up in your urine, and the more that's showing up, the more your kidney arteries are inflamed, and you want to do something about it, like eat better, get your blood pressure better, get your blood sugar better. I won't go through these fancy ones, MPO, LPPLA2, but it shouldn't surprise you that the progress in the lab world is fairly legendary. So my typical inflammation panel now is about 10 different numbers, not just one, the C-reactive protein. And at the bottom of all this is we can get inflammation and inflammation day after day after day. Abnormal chemicals in the bloodstream that can attack arteries can come from smoking, obesity, poor nutrition, can come from infections like in the gum, the colon, the skin, can come from genetic factors and that damn word called age, and uh, other things that we can measure like diabetes. So periodontal disease, gum disease, there's an increased risk of coronary artery narrowing if periodontal disease is present. You can measure that by this carotid thickness, a study done about 10 years ago. Higher levels of C-reactive protein with gum disease, connecting the mouth, inflammation, and ultimately the risk of heart disease. Uh, skip past it, more of the same. So you do want to know these numbers. So, um, we started, and yesterday I presented some data about something called the lipid hypothesis, or the diet heart hypothesis. You eat animal saturated fat rich foods, chicken, eggs, cheese, your blood cholesterol goes up, that circulates clogged arteries. In the last 20 years, a particular individual at Harvard, Paul Ridker, has said that's important, but we've known for way longer than even cholesterol that inflammation matters. In the 1850s, it was a theory presented, but it had never been proven until last November of 2017. So this is very new data. And there's Dr. Ritker's name I just mentioned. He owns the patent for the test, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. He owns it with Harvard, so there's always a little bit of conflict. But he designed a major trial to answer the question, is it really true that inflammation matters? Now, for you and I, what we're talking about is losing your belly fat, eating lots of anti-inflammatory foods, which are plants, getting some exercise, controlling so we get enough sleep and making sure our sleep isn't interrupted with sleep apnea, because that's very inflammatory, getting our teeth checked regularly. Um, and that's an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. This was a drug trial, because the only way to get anything ever studied is that there's potential to sell drugs. And what um, 
Dr. Rinker did, which is very genius, his hair's our liver, and if we eat poorly, don't exercise, smoke cigars and cigarettes, our C-reactive protein goes up, and it can uh, be a measure of how bad our life or our genetics are. But there's a whole series of chemical reactions. He found a drug that blocks um, upstream. So if you block upstream, you'll also lower C-reactive protein. And he designed a 10,000 patient international study. I'm going to go through that. And he knew from data that this drug, this drug is used for about two conditions and only about 200 people in the world have called an orphan drug. The drug costs $200,000 a year to administer. But if you're one of these 200 people, you can apply for orphan drug coverage. But he knew from the use of this drug, canakinamib, that it drops C-reactor protein dramatically. It's an injection you give every three months. So it was an anti-inflammatory drug. If you look in the upper right, he found he you know, got coworkers to do a study of giving people with heart disease this injection every three months or placebo and followed them up for about three years. And the results actually were positive. Um, positive means they were, uh, they, it worked. So what, what, what set the stage was this drug doesn't affect cholesterol. So during the three to four years, cholesterol didn't change at all. Only the C-reactive protein dropped. There was a perfect study set up to ask the question, if we can lower the C-reactive protein, again, do it with exercise, do it with good sleep, do it with a flat belly, do it with plants, uh, do it with um, not smoking, for sure, we know we can lower C-reactive protein, uh, stop eating uh, you know, egg yolks and meat that drive up TMAO, another inflammatory marker. He did it with a drug, didn't matter, and lo and behold, the numbers were small. But the number of events, the number of heart attacks and such were lower on people that got the injection. So it was a big announcement in November, just a few months ago, that we've proven for sure that inflammation matters. Everybody realized, one, two, three, that we're not going to be using a $200,000 drug. An uh, interesting observation during this study was that the rate of lung cancer was much lower in people on the drug. So they actually, the company that makes the drug is now pursuing its use potentially as a prevention of lung cancer. Um, there is a drug, some of you have heard of a drug called methotrexate. Methotrexate is a oral drug used, old drug, used to treat rheumatoid arthritis in some setting. So this study is being repeated now with methotrexate because methotrexate costs about 25 cents a day, not you know, $400 a day or some equivalent. And everybody's chasing the pills. Nobody's doing the big studies that I wish they do to chase the lifestyle, but believe me, it works. So we're back to the end. Uh, we got Jim Fix, we got Winston Churchill. Do you know your arterial age? Do you know your advanced blood work? Do you know that there are therapies out there always beginning with proper diet, proper lifestyle, proper sleep, proper social support, stress management, but maybe including some unique vitamins. Uh, again, I have a book out there, Dead Exacts Don't Get Bonuses, or if you just Google my name, I've written this stuff over and over and over in various journals. Uh, you know, where do you stand? The best kept secret is we can heal our own body. I just threw in a couple pictures, uh, self-promotional, my main restaurant, gorgeous bar, my crazy office, and that's the end. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to answer three questions, and I'm around, I'm on the boat. Uh, yes. So the question is, if you've had a bypass and a strong family of heart disease, what would you do? I'd get very good blood work, even though it's after the bypass, trying to figure out why did that person need bypass? I mean, was it obvious that they smoked two packs a day? But still, uh, there's a lab I don't own called Cleveland Heart Lab that I think does the best blood work, Cleveland Heart Lab. And number two, periodic stress tests, but the one, they're, the CAT scan with the iodine, the androgen, can show the bypasses, so it sometimes is of use long after the bypass. I see a hand way up there. How often should you take that? Good question. Because it's called in the literature the warranty. Yours comes back zero or two. I'd rather it be zero than two, actually, or four. 
five, seven years. That's what the literature says. I'm right now, I've had two zeros, but I'm nine years since the last eight years. I need to do, I need to do it. Um, it's time, so I'll go in soon, but that's about the interval. Now, if you're, if you're high, you can argue never do it again. Um, you know, you know, you know you gotta do A, B, C, D, and E, and we don't know for sure, unless you're on this unique vitamin, that there's really any point in ever rechecking the calcium score. Yes, ma'am. Can you get off of warfarin with a plant diet? Warfarin blood thinner is used for people with metal heart valves. There's no substitute in the world, and you can never get off warfarin if you've got a metal heart valve right now. If you have atrial fibrillation, we used to put everybody on warfarin, now we put them on the other drugs, if they need a drug, Perdaxa, Eliquis, Xarelto. Um, there's very few instances where a plant diet is gonna let a person come off warfarin. Uh, but I'd rather they get on the newer drug if possible, because then they can eat all the leafy greens. Okay. Optimal range for C-reactive protein may high sensitivity less than 1.0, and lower the better. A couple more since they're quickies. Yeah. Yeah. So you, somebody on Eliquis put back on warfarin. Don't know. Uh, I, I, if you don't have a metal heart valve, uh, you know, you can come up and ask me anything personal later, I don't know. I think it was a question, yeah, go. Uh, external versus internal, oh, external carotid feeds your face. So I, if I had to pick a place to put plaque, I, I don't mind it in my external carotid. I mean, I don't want it anyway. Internal is right up to the brain, so yes, that's much more important. Uh, the internal to the brain. Internal. Yeah. Internal. Yeah. Her shirt says vegans do it better, getting back to what we talked about earlier. And apparently, I missed the game changers. Apparently, it's a proven, measurable outcome. <laughs> It's a friend of hers that went to an emergency room, got reassured, went home two days later, went back and was proven that. I've written articles, don't leave an emergency room without one of these scans or something definitive. Because it's natural, if you're okay, you can see a doctor in a week, well that's a very risky week. I'm going to let everybody go, it's lunchtime, we're going to healthy, please, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions.